All right, welcome to another week of Soul Seminar Online. Uh, my name is Chelsea, and I have the honor of introducing Corey Hamilton. Uh, Corey Hamilton got her plant biology, uh, or sorry, Corey Hamilton started in plant biology working on reproductive morphology in the Honor Granacy family during her National Science Foundation research experience for undergrad at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Since then, she has transitioned to understanding host-resistant bacteria wilt disease and primarily the Solanaceae family. Uh, she is currently a PhD candidate at the Plant Pathogen uh, Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with Dr. Caitlin Allen. Um, her other activities include uh, K through 12 outreach with What's Eating My Plants and a part-time instructor at the Madison College in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, introduce Corey also because she is joining the, um, the co-organizer team for a semester. So what we're doing is that early career um, researchers will spend a uh, will spend a semester helping us find and invite speakers for that upcoming semester. So you'll see a little bit more of Corey in the next semester. So with that, you can start sharing your screen, Corey. Awesome. All right. Um, thank you, Chelsea, for that introduction. Um, as I said, I'm Corey Hamilton. I'm a fifth year graduate student in the plant pathology department and at UW-Madison. And I just wanna take a second to thank the organizers of this online seminar. Um, it's a great opportunity to share my work. It's also a um, really wonderful opportunity for me to stay in touch with my plant side of my plant pathology PhD program. Um, I really look forward to this group's fresh eyes and new insight uh, on these problems. So today, I'm here to talk about the mechanism of host resistance to Ralstonia serum. Ralstonia serum, or RS, is a beta proteobacteria. It's, a, it's the causal agent of bacterial wilt disease. Um, this is a soil-borne bacterium that enters roots and infects plants' water transporting xylem vessels. Xylem sap can be seen here bubbling up on a cut stem uh, due to that negative pressure. Um, bacteria wilt causes a characteristic, characteristic excuse me, vascular browning, um, wilt, and then eventual death of the plant. And Rossonia is a genetically diverse and widely distributed species complex. Um, you see here with the bacteria strains transposed onto the the map. Ralstonia has a broad host range with over 200 plant species in over 42 plant families. Um, this range includes families containing tree species, uh, monocots like banana and ginger, as well as at least five members from the ast Asteraceae. Um, however, Ralstonia's largest uh, number of described hosts are in the Solanaceae family. So from this large host range, it's no surprise that Rustonia can cause uh, economic losses for subsistence, cash, and ornamental crops and farmers. Um, this means that effective disease control is essential. Due to Rustonia's high soil sur survival, um, it is extremely difficult and costly to sanitize infested fields. Thus, our best strategy to manage bacterial wilt disease uh, in tomatoes is a breeding line called Hawaii 7996. Um, this is a resistant breeding line. Um, and this resistance is mediated by quantitative trait loci or QTL. Uh, this means that several traits or several host attributes together confer resistance. However, unfortunately, all these traits and genes associated with these traits are not clearly defined. Um, this leaves me with the question of 
what are the mechanisms of Hawaii resistance to uh, bacteria wilt. Even more alarming than the mystery of mechanism is that Ralstonia strains break Hawaii resistance. So when surveying representative strains across the geographic range, I confirm that Ralstonia strains like UW551, which is a black bacteria here, and uh, breaks resistance, while GMI-1000, a green bacteria on the top, can't kill Hawaii. So I want to know, how does UW551 overcome Hawaii resistance? In other words, what links break to allow disease? Specifically, I've decided to focus on the plant Ralstonia interaction inside the xylem, since the xylem is where the pathogen grows quickly during infection. And answering these questions uh, is critical for us to ensure development of durable control. So our lab had previously characterized xylem sap from susceptible tomatoes. Um, so I will be using the same tool to understand the resistance host. And this process goes by first infecting the resistant host uh, by soil soak inoculation, so the purple star. Um, after four days, I actually detop the plants and harvest the xylem sap by collecting the bubble uh, here seen in, the, in this picture. Um, and then the filtered ex vivo xylem sap is then used as growth medium for a secondary inoculum of Ralstonia uh, in this yellow star. Finally, that growth medium is measured over 24 hours and quantified as area under the curve. So now that we have established a metric, I'll push this graphic off to the side for reference and illustrate why I think Hawaii xylem sap inhibits Ralstonia growth and how that relates to bacterial wilt resistance. So what you're looking at here is growth of the secondary inocula or yellow star indicated as a heat map where white means, bacteria, means low bacteria growth and black means high bacteria growth. Um, the xylem sap growth medium is labeled as initial soil soak inoculum, so purple star. Um, as a baseline, an uninfected Hawaii sap equally supports both secondary inoculum growths. So that's what you're seeing. Um, just two gray boxes meaning equal growth. Interestingly, this is not true when the xylem sap from infected plants. So if the infecting soil soak strain, purple star, fails to cause disease in the host or the resistant hosts, that same strain cannot grow as a secondary inoculum in this failure sap. Specifically, GMI-1000 conditioned xylem sap does not support growth of GMI-1000 secondary inoculum as indicated by the white square on this heat map. This suggests that infection with GMI-1000 um, a strain that can't break resistant induces an inhibitory xylem sap composition. But in contrast, uh, resistance breaking strain UW551 actually grows better in this conditioned sap that can't overcome resistance um, than it does in uninfected sap. Even more excitingly, um, we, con we condition sap with the resistant breaking strain, UW551, um, and we see a restored growth in all secondary inoculums. Um, importantly, as previously documented in susceptible cultivars, we see that UW551 grows best on UW551 sap, uh, indicated by the black uh, square there. This suggests that infection with the strains that break resistance enables, or enables xylem sap growth of strains that cannot break resistance. So we wondered if the correlation between resistance breaking and xylem sap improvement holds true for all uh, Rostonia strains.
So we repeated the ex vivo xylem sap growth assays with three more Ralstonia strains. Um, as you see here, in addition to GMI 1000, uh, Ralstonia strains K60 and PSIO7 are also inhibited by resistant Hawaii xylem sap. None of these strains can cause disease on Hawaii tomato. But another resistant frigging strain, African strain CMR15, um, is not inhibited by Hawaii xylem sap, just like UW551. Thus, the ability of Rossinian strains to break Hawaii resistance correlates with growth in Hawaii sap. So this information allows me to, or provides evidence that UW551 and GMI1000 can represent strains that break and succumb to resistant respectively. Um, this, these findings lead me to my next hypothesis that Hawaii xylem sap con contains antimicrobial toxins and moreover that Ralstonian strains UW551 and CMR15 somehow overcome uh, this uh, xylem toxins. And an alternative hypothesis here is that resistant plants reduce growth by decreasing xylem nutrients. If this were the case, concentrating the xylem sap would improve Ralstonia growth. However, when I do concentrate this xylem sap, it's actually more inhibitory to uh, strains that cannot break resistance. Um, so that leads me to say that um, there's not more xylem sap, or there's not more nutrients um, being added when you concentrate it. So it's not necessarily a strictly a nutrients imbalance uh, difference between the susceptible and the resistant host. Um, another argument that can be made is that resistant breaking strain UW551 doesn't trigger um, host defense response. Uh, therefore, it wouldn't experience the host defense response. Um, however, work in our lab uh, did compare the plant defense gene pathway, gene, excuse me, plant defense pathway gene expression um, following infection of uh, non disease causing GMI 1000 and resistant breaking uh, UW551. In this study, they looked at both susceptible and resistance hosts. Um, and for the resistant Hawaii host, they showed that um, GMI 1000 did trigger stronger and faster defense in, um, defenses in the bacterial resistant Hawaii uh, 7996 line. But um, they did also show that both UW551 and GMI 1000 are, um, are being responded to. And uh, as um, inoculum increases, so does the response. So this result suggests that um, break, resistant breaking strain UW551 uh, is successful because it can detoxify um, these antimicrobial uh, chemicals in the xylem sap. So because bacteria can overcome antimicrobial compounds um, by degrading them, um, by developing tolerance, or by exporting them um, via like efflux e pumps, um, I tested the efflux pump hypotheses um, to determine if UW551 defeats Hawaii by exporting a toxin. As expected, mutants in both strains uh, that lacked either a mate or an RNV efflux pump uh, had re reduced tolerance for several toxins. Um, these toxins included some phytolexins. However, these mutants did not change their virulence of either Ralsonia strains. So even with these 
uh, efflux pump knockouts, they were still uh, the same level of virulent, virulence on their uh, resistant host. Additionally, when I did a toxicity, this, this toxicity panel, um, we found that actually UW551, which is the resistant breaking strain, is actually more susceptible than PMI1000 to several classes of toxins. So it's, this evidence seems to disprove the hypotheses that UW551 is pumping out um, these toxins. Next, I wanted to ask if Rossonia metabolizes or breaks down chemicals um, that make resistant plants xylem sap a toxic environment. So if you remember, we observed that Rossonia strains that break resistance change the xylem sap in ways that allow secondary inoculum growth in vitro. So I was wondering if Rossonia breaking Strain UW551 could enable GMI 1000 to infect whole Hawaii plants. So these, um, this infection of a resistant host. And so this is a graph showing Rossonia colonization of Hawaii stems five days after soil soap inoculation. The y-axis shows colony forming units per gram of stem on a log scale where one is added to account for zeros in the colonization. Um, and then this is just a inoculum where each of these dots uh, indicate a bacterial population in a single plant. So when inoculated alone, GMI-1000 rarely colonizes Hawaii plants and it never causes disease symptoms. In contrast, resistant breaking strain UW551 colonizes Hawaii plants well. We see something different when Hawaii plants are inoculated with GMI-1000 and the resistant breaking strain UW551 at the same time. We see that bacteria populations in the stem of a co-inoculation of a one-to-one -one mixture. Um, we see that when UW551 is also present, GMI-1000 can then colonize some of the Hawaii plants. This mixture doesn't do as well as UW551 alone, um, but it does much better than it would if it was than GMI-1000 would if it was inoculated alone. So this result shows that UW551 changes the Hawaii xylem environment in ways that allow it to, that allow it to support infection of a strain that cannot break resistance um, in GMI-1000. So this experiment told me that UW551 succeeds because it changes its external sap environment, um, not because it can tolerate antimicrobial defenses better than GMI-1000. So in summary, we started with two big questions. Um, one is, does the xylem environment play a role in host resistance? And two is, which links break in resistance to, allow, resistance to allow disease. And so this work showed that Rolstonian strain UW551 degrades inhibitors in Hawaii 7996 uh, tomato xylem sap uh, that contributes to bacterial wilt disease resistance. And so my next challenge is to identify these inhibitory chemicals. This means a lot of xylem sap collection, um, treatment of that xylem sap, and then biological assay of the secondary inoculum growth in the treated xylem sap. Um, so some of the treatments that I have uh, looked at is doing a heat inactivation 
So heat and activation um, at both uh, 90 degrees um, and at um, 37C, so uh, pretty um, high um, deac heat deactivation, as well as size exclusion, um, just uh, running into different filters and different uh, gel extractions. Uh, solubility and polarity uh, um, extractions as well. And some of the results from this is that we see that we find that the toxin or toxins, um, because this is a uh, quantitative uh, trait loci mediated resistance, it's plausible that there is more than one toxin contributing to this effect, um, can be deactivated by heat. Um, it can withstand dehydration. So some of my earlier experience actually looked at um, dehydrating the sap and rehydrating the sap. Um, and the toxin or the inhibitory compounds uh, remain in this, this exudial xylem sap. We've also looked at removing the toxin in an organic extraction. So it can be removed by that organic extraction. Um, and some assays actually uh, show us that it can it could be something that's attached or can be attached to something rather large. And so some of my ongoing work is actually looking at uh, metabolomics, so taking this ex vivo xylem sap um, of both a successful and a failed reaction, and looking at the entire metabolome uh, of this of those two compounds. So with that, I just want to give a thank you to my awesome lab. Um, some of the names that are bolded are my undergraduates, um, my collaborators, and funding sources. Um, and a special thank you for you for your attention. And I would love your input um, on this work if you have any questions. Um, and I know that there are many people listening that are listening asynchronously, so feel free to contact me um, at any time. Awesome, thanks, Corey. Thanks for the talk, it's really great. Uh, so uh, if you have a question, just a reminder, you can put it in the chat. You can also uh, unmute yourself if no one else is talking and we can go from there. Um, just a reminder, like the, from the plant perspective, when wilt happens, is it like a collapse of the xylem tissue? Is that what's happening? Yeah, so, so the, vascular, um, the vascular tissue does brown and it can collapse during late disease. Um, but the mechanism in which the wilt um, is often just associated with um, actually clogging the vessels, so actually just um, limiting flow of, of the xylem fluid from one spot to the mm. other. Okay, that makes sense. So it just gets clogged and it can't. Okay, cool. So, Corey, um, yeah, sorry, it's Sandy. Um, I, I was wondering, because there are some wild species of selenium which are resistant to, to Ralstonia. So is it, do you think there's any chance for kind of breeding, for any kind of breeding advances using, using those resistant wild species into cultivated things? Yeah, so that's kind of what Hawaii is. Hawaii technically is this um, weedy, not, it's, it's, it's a lot more, it's, it's not wild relative for sure, but it is in fact like a, like a persicum-esque uh, weedy type of tomato variety where they've tried to do some breeding. Um, the problem with some of our breeding efforts is that these traits are not really well described and when they do do those crossings and they do try to backbreed them in, they come with really um, not agronomically exciting traits. So the Hawaii fruit are really small. And so for growers, they don't want small fruited tomatoes. Um, they also are like indeterminate. So they just continue growing in all directions, um, which is also not necessarily good for um, farmers and growers. Well, I was thinking about, because I the woody nightshade, which is common all over the northern US and all over northern Europe, is highly resistant. Well, there's some, some populations which are highly resistant to Ralstonia. And I was wondering if it's a sort of candidate for CRISPR. 
or something to get that resistance into the cultivated, whatever cultivated thing we have. Yeah, I mean, that would be interesting. I haven't looked at some of the, the mechanism of some of those um, gene for gene type of resistance, but mm. there are gene for gene resistance. And I know that that, um, that is a, the case in like eggplant where we can have a gene for gene type of resistance. Um, so That's yeah, cool, some of those could yeah. be candidates. Um, there's, there's some really nice uh, ETI or, um, excuse me, pattern triggered immunity type of resistance that has come from Arabidopsis even being a, not a real not like, a real plant. <laughs> it's not a real, not, not anybody who works in a rabbit office, that's fine. But uh, um, yeah, so being this, you know, model lab rat plant, there's actually some resistance that can be transferred over. Um, but again, we have to convince people that CRISPR is not bad and that GMOs and are not bad. Um, yeah. So we're working on both avenues. Yeah. That sounds great. That. Great work. Awesome. Stacy has a question that I'll read. Uh, she starts with the caveat that she doesn't know much about uh, pathology, but I'm curious whether if the same xylem tox toxins in the Hawaiian strain are also effective against other pathogens. I thought this might be the case for some of those QTL uh, are involved in the resistance broadly. Yeah, so this is some really early work, which is why I haven't, I didn't put any slides because it's so new. Um, I actually went to a couple of conferences this this fall and got the same similar question. So Stacy, that's a great question. Um, and I've actually been testing Xylem sap on a bunch of different known um, pathogens that aren't necessarily Xylem pathogens. So I do see that the Hawaii or the Hawaii sap as like a whole sap actually has some effectiveness against um, a bacterial spot pathogen. Um, which is uh, really interesting. It's really far removed from uh, Rostonia as a pathogen. Um, and so potentially Hawaii does have, those toxins do have um, um, effectiveness or um, sensitivity to other, pa to other pathogens, um, which when you think about it actually does make sense because the xylem environment isn't typically thought of as a place where a lot of microbes are hanging out in. And so this might be one of those mechanisms just to keep out pathogens in general. Awesome. Um, are there other questions? Yeah, I'll just ask. So what, what do you, do you have any hypothesis? What do you expect to find when you, when you do your mass spec? Anything that you would expect? Because there's loads of stuff in there, right? Yeah, so it would be really nice. So um, I have this collaborator who works on terpenes and of course she wants them to be terpenes and I think that would be really cool. Um, and so just taking a look at some of those big classes of uh, phytoelectins that we know are in tomato. And what I'm thinking is actually that it, it might not be just a um, presence absence thing because I think that I would have that other people would have found it already. And it might just be a quantity thing of how much um, is there. And so mm -hmm. I, I think that's kind of where I'm leaning for. It's probably something that's already there. It's just in a higher abundant quantity than we would have expected it to be um, during infection. Yeah, yeah cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to see your results. I uh, would be really excited. There, it's out, oh. the metabolomics is out and it will be back eventually. I was hoping it would be back before this talk, but <laughs> COVID has slowed everything down. Yeah, mm -hmm. that happens. <laughs> so, have you, are you, are you like following up on Sandy? Sorry, I, I'm intrigued also by wild selenium. And we actually, we actually tried to find uh, Rostonia in, in wild plants, uh, Philip Prior and myself, a few years ago. Um, so, are you, are you looking into this as well? Because if you say that it might be a quantitative effect, then you might actually. Uh, I know you might get some more insights by also including some less related um, plants yeah. because then you can rule out a lot of inter interspecies variation. Or, yeah, so there's actually, uh, so hopefully um, I get some really cool results here and I'm actually thinking about um, my next steps and postdocs and things like that. And so um, or one of my old lab mates actually has her own lab now at UC Davis 
Um, and mm -hmm. she is looking into that branch of um, wild relatives, host diversity. Um, and so if you really are interested in that and want to know a lot, of, a lot more and someone who's thought about it a lot, um, Dr. Tiffany Lillpower at uh, UC Davis would be a great um, person yeah. to talk to. Um, right, I haven't cool. thought about it as much, but yeah, it's definitely out there. I'm just trying to take off a bite size to finish my PhD in the next year or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, cool. Really great suggestions, though. I really appreciate them. Good luck with that. Uh, Pat had a question. She said, what did you find about the size? Could it be a peptide? Um, so I think... Yeah, yes. Um, so... I have two conflicting uh, lines of data, which is, again, while it's not on the slide, but I do have a line of data that says that um, what, I am ex what I have extracted is something that's larger than 10 kilodaltons, which is incredibly big, um, thinking about a peptide or a protein. Um, and then some other lines of data say maybe it's um, not that big, and so, uh, one of my hypotheses early is thinking that maybe it might be um, some type of peptide or some type of protein and that it is in fact, or it's attached to some type of peptide or some type of protein. Um, so I did find that um, some of my lines of data say that it's a, a fairly big um, molecule, so not necessarily in like the uh, terpene or phenolic range, but more in the peptide range. Um, and so I'm working with that um, right now. Haven't followed that lead up too much. Uh, and then the next question uh, is Lyndall, do you want to ask it? Okay. Okay, I'll read it. Uh, so, uh, they say, very cool project. Um, have you done any experiments to see if a bacteria extraction from the more infected strain supports the growth of other strains in the same way uh, the co-infection does? Yes, yeah, so um, I have done some of those experiments. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is normalizing the um, bacteria loads. So with the co-infections, the bacterial loads are all over the place. Um, and so you're not getting a lot of xylem sap that have like consistent bacterial loads. Um, and the reason why I, I really want to normalize for bacterial loads is because the bacteria are eating actively and I want to make sure that the changes that I'm seeing are comparable to some of my other results where I took a very strict bacterial load um, to compare those um, inhibitory compounds. So um, that's kind of the, the hiccup in that, those co-infections. Um, but I am seeing that um, because UW551 is there, so the strain that breaks resistance is present, um, we, we get that um, rescuing of, of growth in that ex vivo xylem sap, the same way as if it was alone. Are there any other questions for Corey? Okay. Well, thanks again for Corey for presenting your work and um, we look forward to seeing you more next semester helping us with uh, co-hosting. Next week is gonna be Gabrielle Dora and she's gonna be talking about petal cell shape and uh, flower pollinator interaction in Nicotiana. Um, all right, so thanks guys. See you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Great talk.